So in this section, we're going to be talking about a new concept called Gibbs free energy. And now the reason why we need to talk about free energy is because spontaneity, the spontaneity of a reaction actually depends on both enthalpy and entropy. And so at this point, what we've said is all right, for most reactions, an assumption that we're going to make is that if it is exothermic, then most of the time it is spontaneous. The other thing that we said is that when entropy increases, then the reaction is going to be spontaneous. And while it's not an either or, it can, it can be both or it can be neither of those. And so we need some way of actually being able to take the concept of enthalpy and entropy and understand and be able to decide whether or not a reaction is going to be spontaneous. And so we use Gibbs free energy to do that. So the Gibbs free energy simply lets us know if a reaction is going to be spontaneous. And this is the formula right here. This is the standard free energy change equals the standard enthalpy change minus the temperature times the standard entropy change. And so those not symbols represent standard conditions. So how are we going to use this? How does your standard free energy change help us to determine whether or not a reaction is spontaneous? Well, if your free energy change is negative, then that lets you know that your reaction is going to be spontaneous in the forward direction. Now, if your free energy change equals zero, that lets you know that you're actually already at equilibrium. And if your free energy change is positive, that lets you know that in the forward direction, your reaction is not spontaneous. However, in the reverse reaction, it is going to be spontaneous. So if we look at an example here, we're going to use the equation that I just showed you before, which is this. Okay. So we're going to calculate your standard free energy change. And so I'm told that my standard enthalpy change is 24.6 kilojoules. And I'm going to subtract from that my temperature times my standard entropy change. Now notice my standard entropy change is in joules. So I'm going to convert that to kilojoules by simply dividing by 1,000 or moving my decimal place over three places to the left. And so I'm going to subtract 298 times 0 0.132 kilojoules per Kelvin. So what I get for my standard free energy change is negative 14.7. So it's as simple as that. Now, since that value is negative, what that tells me is that my reaction is going to be spontaneous. So notice this is extremely helpful because my enthalpy was positive, which lets me know or it gives me kind of a hint that maybe it might not be spontaneous because it's an endothermic reaction. However, my entropy is positive, which makes me believe that it is going to be spontaneous. So I'm just trying to balance the impact of those two. And what I discover is that actually the entropy, the positiveness of the entropy takes over and allows my reaction to be spontaneous. And that is represented by my standard free energy change. All right, so what this is showing you right here is you have the Haber cycle reaction. And so you can start off either with N2 and H2 or NH3 or simply NH3. What this is showing you is if you have excess of N2 or H2, then that process, then that reaction is going to proceed spontaneously until it reaches equilibrium. And same thing for NH3. If you have too much NH3, then it's going to proceed spontaneously in the opposite direction until your Q equals your K, which means that you are at equilibrium. And when you are at equilibrium at that, the base of that curve, your free energy change is going to be zero. So at equilibrium, your free energy change equals zero. So what you should notice here, this should look extremely familiar. This is standard free energies of formation. Now, we looked at this when we were working with entropies. We looked at this when we were working with enthalpies. Do note that standard state for a solid, it's considered to be at standard state if you have a pure solid. For a liquid, if you have a pure liquid. For a gas, it's standard state if you have one atmosphere pressure. For a solution, one molar concentration. And then the standard free energy of formation of an element is going to be zero, which is just what we had said for enthalpies of formation. So I'm not going to do an example with this because this, the work for determining this 
standard free energy of a reaction is just the exact same as what we did with entropy and what we had previously done with enthalpy, where you sum the free energies of formation of the products, and then you subtract from that the standard free energies of formation of the reactants. So what we need to look at is actually deciding, all right, how do I know when I'm going to have a spontaneous reaction or not? So if you look at this table right here, when your enthalpy is negative, okay, and think about the Gibbs free energy equation, which is on the right, your delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If your enthalpy is negative and your entropy is positive, what that means is both of those terms are going to be negative meaning that your delta G is going to be negative and therefore the reaction is going to be spontaneous. However, if your delta H is positive and your delta S, your change in entropy, is negative, that means that your delta G, no matter what the values, is going to be positive, which means it's going to be non-spontaneous. Here's where temperature plays a role. Well, what if, instead of it being super obvious like those first two, what if it isn't so obvious? So for example, if your delta H is negative, and your delta S is negative. Well, here's the problem. Which one has a bigger impact? The degree to which delta H is negative or the degree to which delta S is negative, therefore making negative delta S times T positive. Because if your negative T delta S is extremely positive compared with delta H, then your delta G is going to be positive, making it non-spontaneous. But if it's negative, it's going to be spontaneous. So you need to have low temperature in this case. If your temperature is low, that means that delta H is going to have a larger impact, therefore making delta G negative, and therefore the reaction spontaneous. If your T is too large, however, then your negative T delta S is going to take over, and therefore your delta G is going to be positive, and therefore your reaction on spontaneous. The same thing goes for when your delta H is positive and your delta S is positive. In that case, you're trying to say, all right, which one has a bigger impact, delta H being positive or the fact that your negative T delta S is negative? And in that case, if your temperature is high, that means that negative T delta S is going to be much larger than delta H and therefore your delta G, your change in free energy will be negative and therefore the reaction will be spontaneous. So in some cases, temperature doesn't impact it, it doesn't matter. And then in others, in which delta H and delta S are kind of duking it out, that's where you have to determine how temperature will affect whether or not a reaction is spontaneous or not. So for some reactions, you have to determine whether or not temperature being high or temperature being low favors a spontaneous reaction, just like what we talked about. And the other thing is, often you'll be asked to find a critical temperature. Well, the critical temperature is where the temperature at which your delta G is going to be zero, and so if it's above that or below that, that'll cause delta G to be positive or negative. So basically determining at what temperature above that will your reaction be spontaneous, or below that will it be non-spontaneous, or whatever the circumstance may be. So in a lot of cases, we're actually going to have a change in free energy that is not standard. And so our way of dealing with that is by using this formula. So your free energy equals the standard free energy plus R, which is a constant, times your temperature times the natural log of Q. And so in a problem, you would use this, for example, if I gave you your standard free energy change as a given, which it isn't obvious here, but it is a given, I will give that to you and then give you a reaction. And so basically what you're trying to determine is you need to first calculate your Q and then calculate your free energy change under non-standard conditions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these pressures and I'm going to determine what the Q is. Okay, and so therefore there, there's, there's my reaction quotient formula right there. Okay, so I'm going to take the pressure of NH3 and squared divided by the pressure of N2 times the pressure of H2 cubed. And so I'm going to plug in the values that I have. And so I get, for my Q, I get 18.96. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to plug that in to my equation. Negative 33.3 .3 is a given. It would have to be given two, or you would find it on a table. And then you're going to add to that your R, which is, it's actually given to you as 8.314 joules. But keep in mind, you got to be careful kilojoules versus joules with these equations. So I converted it just to make it into kilojoules by making it 0 0.008314. Then I multiply that by the temperature, which is 298. And then I multiply that by the natural log of my Q, 
which is 18.96. And so what I get for my free energy change is negative 26.0 kilojoules per mole. So that's one situation in which if I'm not at standard conditions, I can still determine my free energy change simply by using your Q value and then your given standard free energy change. So here's another situation. If I take that previous formula and I say, all right, I am at equilibrium. Well, I'm, if I'm at equilibrium, my free energy change is going to be zero and my reaction quotient, my Q is going to be equal to my equilibrium constant. And so I'll plug in K for Q and delta G is zero. And therefore I get this equation right here, which is that my standard free energy change equals negative RT times ln of K. And so this is important because what this allows me to do is say, all right, if my standard change in free energy is negative, that means that the ln of K must be positive, right? In order to have that value be negative, then ln of K has to be positive. Therefore, in, in order for ln of K to be positive, my K must be larger than one. In reverse, if my standard free energy change is positive, that means that the ln of k has to be negative, which means that my k has to be less than 1. And so that helps me to see where exactly my equilibrium lies if I'm curious in determining that 